Welcome to Here Now, a season of audio theater from Keen Company. We're an award winning nonprofit theater in New York City, championing identification and connection through stories about the decisive moments that change us. I'm Jonathan Silverstein, the artistic director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to 1993 by Finkel, the first production in our season of audio theater. Join us in embracing the virtual off Broadway experience. Take a moment to find your seat, silence any distractions, and lower your house lights. It's time to settle in for a night at the theater and enjoy 1993. Previously on 1993. You know, 512 is not just where Janae and Byron and now Stephen live in 1993. It's also where I lived. Um, and my dream in 1993, well, it wasn't even a dream. It was like, I felt like I had a calling. Like, I believed it was my destiny to become a pop star. And I spent the better part of the year making my debut pop album, which I called... You. You, 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 you. What's your confession? You. I've been following you. Following me. And I know you come to Wonder Bar on Sunday nights to have a couple drinks before you head over to Limelight. Uh, the third reason I loved going to the Wonder Bar was because, well, I used to see Steven in there all the time. One night, I gathered my courage and I followed him in to the back room. I tried to get his attention, but he didn't see me. Or he didn't choose to see me. Hey, uh, Finkel here. So, I have a story to tell you. Well, it's really two stories. Both are about Stephen. I spent two nights with Stephen in the year 1993. This episode is about the first night, 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 the first night. Okay, the first night we spent together was completely by accident. It was in late June. Oh, uh, before we get to that, though, I, I just for some context, say I know in episode one, I had talked about making my pop album and spending the whole year making it. But um, to be truthful, by uh, late June, I hadn't really gotten very far with it. I, I don't think I'd actually even recorded any real songs. Um, I was, you know, I was basically going through a semi-secret gay adolescence at this time. So there was just a lot of other things preoccupying me. But I think the truth was that I just didn't have a subject yet. Uh, I had been working the night shift at the Royalton Hotel. Um, I'd been there since early spring, I think like the very beginning of March or something. Um, the Royalton hired through a casting director. A friend of mine worked there and recommended me. And the first interview I had was basically like a go see. I had to stand against a white wall and an intern took a Polaroid of me and they said they'd call me. I wasn't confident I'd get a call, but I did. They said they felt I'd be perfect for the night shift. Which uh, basically tells you and me where I stood on the attractiveness scale. <laughs> Just cute enough that at two in the morning, I'll look pretty good. On my very first night on the night shift, Jerry, the night manager, and now my boss, told me two things. He was like, girl, <laughs> for every month you work on the night shift, you are going to lose a year of your life. These are like totally terrifying words to hear. But as I worked on the night shift, I started to realize that I think he was telling the truth. Um, second, he said, on my nights off, I should keep my night shift schedule. Otherwise, it's going to be too hard to come back to it. Uh, so that's what I did. And that's how I ended up spending my first night with Steven. 
It was a Sunday night around 10 p.m. and I was heading out to the deli to get my quote-unquote breakfast, um, which was an egg sandwich on a toasted everything bagel with salmon, cream cheese, tomato, and bacon. I used to have this every night before work. Then in the middle of the night, I would go to the 24-hour deli on 42nd Street and I'd get a pastrami on rye with pickles, um, two Butterfingers, and a large cherry Coke. <laughs> in case it's not implied, I was starting to get a little like a little soft around the middle, which I was self-conscious about, but also not connecting at all to what I was eating. In my own way, I was totally spiraling. As I said earlier, I was going through this sort of like semi-secret K adolescence. Um, it was more than, it wasn't totally semi-secret. I like, I had just really come out in 1993. So, um, like in high school and all through college, I had hooked up with guys, but never officially. Uh, that's like a long story, but most of my sex life with men up to this point was in like adult bookstore booths or in parks or cars. Like that's how I first experienced my sexual desire through places of shame. The last semester of school, I semi came out to a couple friends who I told I was exploring my bisexuality. Um, why did I think that was better than telling the truth? I had one friend, Joe, who was in a similar position. We would go out together to boy bar and between drinks and dancing and cruising would talk about when we were going to come out to our family and friends. I would say to Joe, like, I'm just waiting for the right time to tell everyone. And I remember very clearly he said back to me, there's never a right time. I think we just have to do it. Okay, so I want to get back to uh, the first night I spent with Stephen. But before I get back to that, I have a confession I need to make. Okay, um, by 1993, I had already been obsessed with Stephen for four years of my life. Hmm, obsessed may be too big of a word, I think. Um, I don't know, maybe not. I'm going to let you decide. All right. So here's my story. Okay. So when I was a freshman in college, Stephen and I lived on the same floor in the dorm. He lived at the opposite end of the hall. I remember seeing him at like a floor meeting the first week we were in school. And that very first time I saw him, I was like overwhelmed. I guess I had a crush on him, but I didn't know that that's what I was feeling. I remember that I became so obsessed with him that I sat in the hallway at night just to see him come home or go out. I was hoping he'd want to talk to me, but he didn't see me. He like, he never saw me. The entire time we were in school together, even at parties, which Stephen was often at, he was like in a totally different sphere. He wasn't in any particular circle, but like everyone knew who he was. And there were all these like stories about him, like kind of like folklore. Like there was a story about him painting a mural on his wall in his dorm room. And that's how he got kicked out of the dorms. The biggest story was really, though, about this affair he allegedly had with uh, the dance teacher, Paul, um, which then got Paul fired and Stephen kicked out of school. And then there were all these stories about what he was doing when he was out of school. Like, people said that they had seen him shooting up heroin on the Lower East Side. Others said that he was a high-end escort on the Upper East Side. I don't really know what happened to him. I never, like, really found out. But... I will never forget my first impression of him at our dorm floor meeting. He was sitting cross-legged, kind of diagonal to me, and he was picking at a scab just below his knee. He was wearing jean shorts and a striped t-shirt, and his hair was kind of like parted to the side. and It hung over the side of his face like like flock of seagulls, new wavy. And he kept like flipping his hair back. Like, oh, it was just, he didn't say a word that night. In fact, I don't remember him speaking at all until I run into him in 1993 in the hallway of our building. Okay, 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 but back to the story. So I'm coming out of my apartment to go get my breakfast, which just to remind you is an egg sandwich on toasted everything bacon with salmon, cream cheese, tomato, and bacon. And I see Steven outside Lorena's apartment. Lorena is on the floor um, and he's trying to like pick her up. Um, I had not met 
or seen Lorena until this night. Um, I, though I could hear her often over like the, especially over the past couple months in her apartment, like crying a lot. Um, I'd never actually seen her. She's lying on the floor in our hallway, right in front of her apartment. And, um, she's like completely just like a messy drunk. And the thing I remember most is her hair, which was like this kind of wild mane that was clearly at some point this super vibrant blonde, but is now faded and had specks of gray in it and um, just felt like very mousy and unkempt. Um, We eventually get her into the apartment and um, get her into bed. And afterwards, uh, Stephen thanks me and introduces himself. And I remind him that we know each other from school and he tells me he doesn't remember me, which, uh, completely rips my heart out and I fucking love it. (laughs) Um, we're about to part ways and suddenly the idea of not spending more time with Steven is just like killing me. And impulsively I invite him to come out with me to the limelight. Um, I had been invited to the limelight from uh, by Jerry, my boss at work, who was going there on his night off with some friends, and um, I had originally not planned to go. I'm not a club person. I don't like the nightlife. I was just planning on having my breakfast and coming back and watching some movies, but I know that Steven loves the nightlife, and I thought maybe this would be a way to get him to you know, spend more time with me. An hour later, Steven is at my door wearing combat boots, cut-off jeans, which he really loves those cutoff jeans and an act up t-shirt, which he's fashioned into like a midriff tank top. Um, and between the time I saw him at Lorena's and this moment, he's shaved his head. I'm wearing cargo shorts and a gap t-shirt. And Steven is like, is that what you're wearing? <laughs> uh, in the cab over, Steven I remember this so clearly. He's looking out the window of the cab. He's like kind of slumped over. He seems depressed. And I remember him running a finger over the upholstery because it made this like kind of this like squeaky sound. He lets out a sigh at least twice. He's like. And um, I want to say something to him, like, you know, I want to be like, penny for your thoughts, or um, I want to talk about it. (laughs) But um, I don't, I don't say anything. Instead, I just listen to the cabbie who's switching channels, trying to find something they like. You have power. Your power is your voice. Stephen asks me to pay for him. He says, and I remember this really clearly because I've used this phrase a million times since then. He says, I'm cash light at the moment. He tells me it's his birthday, so it'd be a present. Actually, no, it's not his birthday. Don't ask me how I know that. Well, whatever, you're not going to ask me, but I'm going to tell you. So the thing was, I had worked when I was an undergrad. Um, I, I had a work study job in the administration office, and I... Uh, looked up his file. So I know his birthday is not in June, but in July. It's July 24th. But I wish him a happy birthday anyway. I'm going to play along. And I pay for him and me. And then I give him 80 extra dollars.
this song is a warning. Listen up. Don't go to that haunted place. Listen to my solid case. Yeah. Listen to my solid case. Yeah. No. You think danger is your kind of race, but fear shines upon your face clear. Now, oh love, you, you want with these words from me. You better watch your back between the sheets. If these words reverberate, don't be staying out too late. When you fall in lust, now, babe, you gotta keep yourself on land. Winds will blow your heart around, and you will not know where you stand, where you stand. So if these words reverberate, don't be staying out too late. If these words reverberate, don't be staying out too late. We find Jerry in the center of a gaggle, dancing with their shirts off and doing bumps of coke. Jerry grabs me and gives me a huge hug, which totally surprises me. He pulls away, he looks me over, and then hugs me again for a little longer. And I'm like, is he high or is he into me? I hadn't even considered Jerry this way, I mean, but now I'm looking at him in the light of the club with his shirt off and it's kind of hot. A lot of the nights of the royalty, he makes me laugh. And for the first time in my life, I consider the possibility that maybe attraction could be the simple. I never thought of actually dating the guy. Jerry slides Coke under my nose. I've never done it before. I don't really want to do it, but I'm feeling pressured. He yells at me like, take your shirt off. Everyone thinks something's wrong with your body if you don't take your shirt off. I pretend I don't hear Jerry. Then Steven sidles up. He puts his arm around my waist and he's like, I'm Steven. I'm friends with him. Second heartbreak of the night. Steven does not know my name. <sighs> See, he does a bump of Coke and then he does another. And then he tells us he's going to look for his boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or something like that. It's, he says it's hard to explain. And Jerry's like, what's your boyfriend's name? And Steven's like, Jean. And Jerry's like, John? <laughs> and Steven's like, no, Jean. And Jerry's like, John? And then Steven doesn't respond again. He just disappears into the club. Um, Jerry's talking my ear off and he has his hand on my back and he's definitely into me, but I'm like not paying attention now. I'm just thinking about Steven. I'm like, wait, he has a boyfriend? And his boyfriend is here? Who is this person? Who is this Jean? Now, just to be clear, like, I, I actually didn't know who Jean Wayne Genet was at this point either. It was like, I didn't really know anybody in my building. You know, I had no, I only knew that Steven lived there. So I didn't know at all who he was talking about or that this was all happening. I start to have a panic attack. I ask Jerry for another bump and um, then things speed up. Everything is so bright and loud. Everything is so shiny and fast. Then Stephen is back. He asks Jerry for more coke. He begins to dance very aggressively. I get closer. I put myself in front of him, but he's sort of in his own world. Then some guy comes up to him and tries to talk to him. It seems like they know each other, but Stephen ignores him. I'm close enough that I can hear just a little bit of what they're saying. Hey, don't ignore me, man. Give it back. Hey, what the fuck? Give me back my wallet. I don't have your wallet. Not some fucking pickpocket. The fight leads out into the circle around them, infecting us. Soon it seems like we're all part of the fight. Steven is at the center, raging with a, a joy that like shines so bright it blinds me. Security shows up and somewhere in the melee I get kicked in the face and hit the floor.
The next thing I remember, I'm on the roof of a tenement building on the Upper East Side. I remember this because the sun was starting to rise. And I remember that because Stephen was sitting on the edge of the building about 15 feet away, his back to me, and he was like a black outline against the sun. The other guys are splayed on the roof, talking and giggling. Jerry is sitting close to me and he's doing coke. My face hurts. I can tell I'm going to have a black eye. Jerry lets me see myself in the mirror he's using to snort off of, and it's indeed, it's coming in all blue and black and green and yellow. Then, Jerry kisses me. Is it embarrassing to tell you that this is my first real kiss? Up until now, I'd kissed men, but never a man that I knew. I wish I could say that I appreciated this in the moment, but my lips were dead to him. Instead, I'm watching Stephen, who has just stood up and taken all his clothes off. He raises his arms up to the sky and he screams to the heavens, Fuck you! It's like a catharsis, a manifesto, a call to arms. And then another guy gets up and starts screaming too, and then another. And then they begin dancing and laughing and touching each other's bodies, and they're pouring wine over themselves. At some point, Jerry leaves me and joins them. Can I touch your chest? Can I touch your lips? Can I touch your back? Can I touch your thigh? Can I touch your thigh? Steven is at the center of the group. Dionysus. I don't know if something has really changed or maybe it's just the coke and the night and the hit in the face and the confusions between love and desire, but he looks different to me. Like something has changed. He's harder angles, sinewy, where once he seemed lanky. The sweetness of his face or whatever was left of it is gone. His eyes look more predatory. The others worship and devour him, hungry ghosts, disciples. All I want is to find the courage to join them, to be that free, to touch Stephen, to be with Stephen. But something about him both terrifies me and attracts me in such a deep way, I'm overwhelmed. I get up and leave. No one seems to notice. I walk home from the Upper East Side straight down 1st Avenue to 5th Street. The city is so beautiful in the mornings before the world wakes up. It's so much quieter than it seems could be possible. It's like a silent witness. Have you ever had that experience? Back at 512, I find our apartment to be empty. I look into Brooke's room and her bed is still made. She didn't come home last night either. My mind circles back to Stephen, as if it hadn't been circling anything else the whole time. Um, Suddenly, I am completely overwhelmed by yearning, and I feel this need, like I need to create something. So I pull out the keyboard, and I start to write music and sing for the first time. And I decide right then that I'm dedicating my album to Stephen, that every song will be about him, that I'll call the album You, and he would be the you in question. And then when I'm done with the album, I'll like put it on a master tape and I'll give it to him and I'll share it with him and he'll love it and he'll really know me and he'll fall in love. What's wrong with me that all I want is pain? What part of me am I trying to kill? Something in my middle's just not right Something in my middle wakes me up at night Feeling so little makes me wanna cry Something in my middle, something in my middle He stabbed me hard deep Feels like 
think I will die And bleeding Heart deep Forever Heart deep The wound will scar and scar Forever Heart beat low Maybe I've gone crazy Maybe it's just gotten too hazy Or maybe I see right through my smoke and mirror show Oh no, oh no Maybe I'm meant to be nobody Maybe I'm not smarter than anybody Maybe there's nothing right about me We'll see You stab me Heart deep Feels like I will die And bleeding Heart deep bone Forever Heart deep The wound will scar and scar Something in my middle is just not right Something in my middle wakes me up at night Feeling so little makes me want to cry Something in my middle, something in my middle Something in my middle is just not right Something in my middle wakes me up at night Feeling so little makes me want to cry Something in my middle, something in my middle, What's something in my middle is just not right. Something in my middle wakes me up at night. Feeling so little makes me wanna cry. Something in my middle, something in my middle. What's something in my middle is not right. This has been episode five of 1993 by Finkel, directed by Jonathan Silverstein. All voices, music, sound, noise, and silence created and compiled by Finkel. Publishing assistance by Garrett Schultz. This performance is part of Keen Company's Here Now season of audio theater, led by artistic director Jonathan Silverstein. The season's audio consultant is Garrett Schultz. The Here Now theme is composed by Billy Reese. Enjoying what you've heard so far? Hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And please take a moment to rate us and leave a review. Want exclusive perks, bonus content, and invites to virtual opening night parties? Sign up for a Here Now season membership. Packages start at just $1 a month. Looking to support off-Broadway theater artists? Make a tax-deductible gift to Keen Company and contribute to Stories of Connection. Learn more at www.keencompany.org. Thank you for listening. I look forward to joining you at the Virtual Theater again soon. <laughs>